I've enjoyed this uh, series on the, the last week of Jesus. Uh, I have, for the most part, stayed away from the book of John. I've stayed in uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Uh, but in John, you have to remember that it was written when the Apostle John was in his 90s. We don't know exactly how old. So it had been somewhere around 60 years since he had seen the resurrected Christ. He had done many different ministries and gone in different places. His uh, last ministry was at the church in Ephesus. There they tried to kill him. They tried to boil him in oil. He didn't die. He re- the Lord, you know, the, the thing is, is that you are immortal until God says it's time to go home. Nothing can come against you until God says it's your time. And we should live that way. We shouldn't be scared of anything. And evidently the Apostle John wasn't. But because he wrote it in his later age, Matthew, Mark, and Luke had already been written and was known by everyone. But his was more personal. It was more about relationships. And when you get to the 12th chapter, there's 21 chapters in the book of John. When you get in the 12th chapter, it begins, Jesus' last word. And really, chapters 12 through 19, that's all they cover is the last week. 20 and 21 talk about the resurrected Christ. But you can, you can see that so much is about personal things, thinking, trying to get across to them that he focused on relationships. Love is something that people use today so flippantly. It just kind of rolls off our tongue. We say that we love this. We say that we love that. It's basically a representation, for the most part, in our society today, it's a representation of how you feel in the moment. In the moment, the emotion of the moment, if you look at something, you say, well, I love that. Or you'll say, I don't love that. And we can almost be bipolar. We can love it, not love it, love it, not love it. We can hate it. Well, I kind of like it. You know, make up your mind. And Christ never spent a split second on earth when he wasn't loving. This is the God of love. This is the God of all of eternity who had everything, lacked nothing, but he came to be, Jesus came to be our Savior, our Sovereign, because of love. Because we needed it, not because we deserved it, not because we earned it, but we were the objects of his love. And as John looks back on it that last week, he just sees so much of the love of Christ and you can just see it kind of coming from him. And one of the last pictures that he shared was um, this picture in the upper room where Jesus washed the disciples' feet. Now, he had had his disciples there with him, and and they had already had a meal. They had already spent some time together. There had probably been a lot of conversation, probably some laughs, uh, people coming in to minister to them, take care of all those things. But then Jesus just turned the moment. Just, you know, how you're sitting around talking, but in in a moment, everything, the atmosphere in the room just totally changed. In in John 13, verse 4, it said Jesus rose after supper, laid aside his garment, the outer garment, took a towel and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin. The water wasn't already there. He went over, got a, 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 some water, went to the basin where usually a servant by the door when you came in, a servant would wash your feet when you just came into the room. There was no servant there. So Jesus poured water into the basin and he went around to the disciples in verse 5 and he says, and he began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. They looked down upon Jesus as Jesus bowed before them took their feet and placed it in the the basin and began to, with his hands, to wash them. Dirty, 
stinking, tough, rough, smelly feet. And he did it with a tender touch. He did it with love. He cared. It mattered to him. This was a picture that John, 60 years later, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, it comes back to him. And I believe it was almost as if he was just doing it again, like, like right then and there. Possibly, I don't know, but maybe even a tear came up in his eyes as he thought about the King of glory bowing before him and washing his feet. Here's the thing. The Almighty had no problem walking in humility and placing others above himself. Paul talked about this in his letter to the Philippians in chapter 2. He, he said there, Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men and being found in appearance as a man. Listen now. He lowered himself. That's what this passage is called. It's called the emptying. He lowered himself. He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. He came not to be served, but to serve. This was his purpose. This was his mission. This was his passion. There was never and has never, nor will there ever be anyone who deserved more glory and honor and praise than Jesus. But he came not to be seen in that way, but he came to serve. He came to wash feet. He came to lower himself, humble himself. He came to die the most humiliating, cruel death. In 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9, it says this, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you, through his poverty, might become rich. He came having everything, emptied everything out, so that we who had nothing could have everything that heaven holds. What an amazing God we serve in chapter 13 verse 12 he came back to the table so it says so when he had washed their feet taken his garments and sat down again he said to them do you know what i've done to you you call me teacher and lord and you say well for so i am if i then your lord and teacher have washed your feet you also, come on, you also ought to wash one another's feet. As Jesus emptied himself and did something so menial, he says, I've given you the picture, come on, listen, church, of what real love is. You might in your mind's eye have a picture of love. You've defined it. You've let the world define it. You've let others see you, and, and you've, you're following their image. But I'm telling you, I've given you a picture. He said, you, I am Lord and teacher, but if I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I've given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Remember that phrase. Most assuredly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master. Can y'all agree with that? The master should be greater. But he says, <clears throat> nor is he who is sent greater than he who sent him. Jesus who is sent the Father. If you know things, hear this now, listen. 
This is where you're going to get something good out of the Word of God today. Blessed are you if you do them. Y'all look up here. You can be blessed with the full blessings of Christ if you understand what Christ did for us and you follow that example and how you live. Blessed, anointed, empowered with every blessings of the fruit of the Spirit, all love, all peace, all goodness, come on, everything that flows from God, blessed are you if you'll do these things, if you'll follow these things. So easy it is to get your mind off of everything today that will distract you from what God's trying to say and teach. But please hear this. God wants to teach you love. God wants you to understand love. God wants you to know these things. Because if you find that, blessed are you. True love elevates others instead of them making them a tool to your own happiness. Everybody in this world loves. Would y'all agree with that? They just don't love the way God says that we should love. They love in a very human way. If it makes you happy, you'll love it. If it doesn't make you happy, not so much. If you like someone, if you find joy in someone, you'll hang out with them. If you don't, you won't. There are people that are easy to get along with. Y'all say amen. There are people that make it their mission not to be easy to get along with. Y'all know them too? Jesus can come and pick and choose just the lovely and the easy. He loved all. In this world, we have that term, the, the, the term the Bible uses that is defined as love, is phileo. It brings you satisfaction. It's brotherly love. It's kindness that people have. And you're good with that. I'm going to make this statement, and I'll stand behind it with all my heart. Just about everything that you see, I would say, well over 95, probably closer to 99%. Most of the love that you see today is phileo. We'll love as long as we like it. But if anything comes in the way of that, if anything brings us discomfort, if anything is, it just doesn't satisfy, if anything doesn't sit right, there will be something that happens within us and will change. This boy loves this girl. She's the most beautiful. She's the most wonderful. He, he, he can't do anything without thinking about her. He loves her. He loves her. He loves her. And she looks at him and says, I don't want to be around you anymore. And he says, you dirty dog. <laughs> and he can walk away angry. It can change like that because it's about us. But love that is born within us, that you're never going to know until you meet Christ. But after Christ becomes your Savior and Lord, and He comes with His Holy Spirit to live within you, that Holy Spirit brings the love of God. So it's not just about phileo, how you feel, how you accept it, but it becomes God's love with the maturity of that. Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14 says this, For the love of Christ compels us. The, the King James says it constraineth us. The word, it's a verb, it's an action word. It means to hold together lest it fall into pieces. So preventing something to fall away, y'all look at me, it's like the hands hold it together to keep it from falling apart. I'm going to 
say something, probably the only part of my sermon you'll remember. How many of you remember Plato? Raise your hand. How many of you played with Plato? Either as a kid or you had children or grandchildren. It's that stuff. And, and, and you know what you do with Plato? You make things out of it. You make it, shape it, form it. And how many of you, when you got through with that thing, you said, oh, that's so nice. And then you... and you formed it into something else, right? The love of Christ, listen, forms us into something else. It holds us together. For the first five months of this year, I kept saying this phrase over and over in church. One heart, one accord. As we started studying through the book of Acts and how God began to grow his church, it was when they came together, one heart and one accord. And God formed something out of us. He moved us together. The love of Christ, Paul says, constrains me. It forms me into the image of Christ. In John 13, in verse number 34, Judas had left the room. Said, go do what you got to do. And he looked at the others in the room. Verse 31, he said, now the Son of Man is glorified and God is glorified in him. But in verse 34, he says this, a new commandment I give to you. It's a gift that you must receive from the hand of God. It's a blessed present. Remember what I said, blessed are you, right? It, it's a wonderful, blessed present. But here's what he says. He said, a new commandment I give to you that you, let's say it together, love one another. As I have loved you, you also love one another. In verse 35, we're going to talk more about this in just a moment, but he says, all by this, all will know that you're my disciples if you have love for one another. Now, you may have heard this and, and, and you said, well, I, I, I thought this was not a new commandment. The, sh the, the Shema, right? Deuteronomy 5. Jesus was asked by one of the scribes what was the first and greatest commandment. In, in Mark 12, uh, verse 29, Jesus answered him, the first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. This is Deuteronomy 5. He's quoting it. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first commandment. Then in verse 31, he said, And the second, like it, hold on, like it, there is one God. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And one that's just the same way, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment than these. No greater commandment than these. We make an intention to love God. But really, if we want to love God, but we don't have love for others, it really says something about our love for God. And he frames it as your neighbor, whoever is your neighbor. We, we can talk about that, you know. But... Love them just like you love yourself. And I've always said, this was my, my phrase, I said, well, that's a whole lot of love. But you know, the truth of the matter is, how much do you love yourself? Some people don't love themselves very much. They've been hurt, so they treat others badly too. Just about most bad behavior comes out of a wound. I heard this past week. Have y'all heard of the, the term narcissist? We, how many of y'all know narcissist? How many of them are in your family? 
And, and one of the things about the narcissist, everything's about them, right? I heard this past week from a, a, a renowned person who knows who studied this so very much, and he had five things that he said about narcissists. But he said the number one thing is, is that they, they react out of a deep wound in their life. They've been hurt. Y'all ever heard the phrase, hurt people or hurt other people? And we've all been hurt, haven't we? And we all hold something back because we don't want to be hurt. So we go through life and we're nice to the people who are nice to us, but we're rude to the people who are rude to us. We're, we'll strike back like a snake if somebody strikes at us. Now, we're in church, so can we be honest? Is that true? If we love our neighbor as much as we love ourselves, that's a limit to our love. But Jesus said in John 13, a new commandment. Now, he didn't come up and just say, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't give you the complete stuff, so i got to give you something new. No, it's a new understanding of, a, of a, the same thing that we should already know. But here, this is the caveat. He says here, <clears throat> As I have loved you, that you also love one another. Hold on. So it's not how they treat you. It's how Christ treated you. Do unto others as they do unto you. No, that's not what he says. But that's kind of what we do. I'll treat you as good as you treat me. Or do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Hold on. What if we said, do unto others as Christ did for you? Now, let's be honest here. <clears throat> Most of us are going to leave and treat people the way we want to treat people. We'll decide, we'll choose who we can bestow our greatest to. Now, hold on. That's the truth. I'll give them a little love. I'll throw them a little bone. Did Christ withhold anything? Christ can't, oh, I can feel the, I can feel the uncomfortableness in this room when I'm saying this. Christ did not come and withhold anything, but he gave you everything, and it's going to make you uncomfortable to give to others the way Christ gave to you. We want to decide. Well, you're correct. Love is a choice, but we choose to love Christ, and we choose to love like Christ. He said, by this, all will know that you're my disciples how you love one another. This is what will draw them to God. It's how Christ's love is in us. We will be blessed by it. He promised us that. Blessed are you. But others will be blessed by it because when they see the power of God's love working in us, they'll say, that's, that's so different. That's not like the world. And when they see that, they'll be drawn to God. And when they look at us, they'll say, you are Christ's true disciple. And you know what heaven will say about that? Wow. Wow. You know what the church will say about that? Wow. And you know what the anointing Holy Spirit, the power of Christ in his church today will say about that? Let me, can I make this harder? Well, let me make it a little bit harder. There, there's a, a high calling here. A high, high calling here. And, and I, I just don't want you to miss it. In, in Matthew chapter 5. Anybody ever heard of the Sermon on the Mount? Okay. Who preached it? Jesus preached the Sermon on the Mount. Pretty good sermon? I am in. Chapter 5, 
verse 30 or 38. You have heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. How many of you have lived your love like that? You poke me in the eye, I'm going to poke you in the eye. You knock out my tooth, I'm going to knock out your tooth. In Jesus' name, here we go, right? But I tell you not to resist an evil person, not to resist an evil person. Don't even resist an evil person. But whoever slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other to him also. Can I get an amen? You lie. If anyone wants to sue you and take away your tunic, let him have your cloak also. Whoever compels you to go one mile, not out of duty, not out of responsibility, oh, I'm doing this for Jesus, but out of love, go the second mile. Give to him, him who asks you. From him who wants to borrow from you, do not turn away. Some of you are going to try this at the end of the sermon. You're going to say, hey, can I borrow $20 to go out to eat? You have heard that it was said you should love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I say to you, love your enemy. Did Christ love his enemy? Bless those who curse you. That doesn't mean I bless you. In no, it means, Lord, bless them. Lord, pour out your goodness on them. Lord, I pray favor over them. I pray conviction so that they can move from their ugliness and find your love. So, Lord, pour out your best on them. Do good to those who hate you. Pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. By the way, can I just say to you, verse 44 is one of the most powerful, freeing verses in all of Scripture. Practice it, and you'll see the power of God. Don't worry about the other person. They belong to Him. God will take care of them. You just do what you're supposed to do. What I have found is that other person, as smug as they may be, they think that they're right. They think that they're justified. That's God's business. That's not your business. Your business is to treat them the way Jesus treated them or would treat them. That you may be sons of your Father in heaven, for he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward of you? That's phileo. That's the worldly love. If you're loving the people who are good to you, that's easy. Do not even the tax collectors do the same? If you greet your brethren only, what do you do more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do so? Therefore you shall be perfect, complete, mature, lacking nothing in your life. If you want to be like God, if you want to be perfect like Him, this is what you must do. This is how you must follow it. This is a commandment, folks. To not obey in a commandment, is that not sin? Let me try that again. If it's a commandment of God, any of the top ten, if you break it, is that not sin? James 4.17 says, To know to do right and not to do it, to him it is sin. To know to love and choose not to do it, it's sin. A commandment. We have to do it. We should want to do it. This comes very simply. You submit to the Lord. Because simply as you submit to the Lord, God will flow through you. I don't have that kind of love. That's right. It's okay. He does. He does. God can do exceedingly abundantly above. What the world needs now is love, sweet love. 
How can the world know if they don't see the love in us? Two choices are going to be made today. And if I'm rude, forgive me. But I'm just going to be bold as attack. Two choices are going to be made today. You're going to leave and you're going to choose who you're going to love and to what degree you're going to love. You're going to choose to turn the cheek or you're going to choose to try to bust their cheek. You're going to seek the face of God, His benevolent, blessed hand. Yield to others. Wash stinking feet. Compel is an action word. You're going to let God build something amazing. Or you're not. It's simply going to be His way or your way. His way is blessed. Your way is sin. I don't know anybody that couldn't do better in love. Do you? And we've all seen people in hard situations. We've all been in those hard situations. What is our reaction going to be? Now, one quick caveat. If you're here today and you do not know Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord, you're never going to be able to love like that. You need the love of Christ to forgive you. You need the love of Christ to form Himself within you. Then and only then can you go out and love like Jesus loved. That's why you're going to know heaven. That's why you're going to enjoy heaven. That's why... All the wonderful things of God can be yours. It all begins with loving Jesus. Knowing Him and loving Him. Your choice.